Friends, welcome. I hope you're well, I hope you're thriving, and I hope your practice is cultivating and developing in the right way. Today I want to discuss some comments um, I've received in uh, the last few days, uh, some feedback, and I want to discuss some, some topics uh, in this, uh, in this uh, talk, in this discussion. First of all, uh, I want to discuss <clears throat> this ongoing issue about uh, meat, meat eating, right? Meat consumption. Okay, so the problem with uh, the meat eating uh, consumption is in Buddhism, we've done a lot, the Buddha did a lot to really minimize the consumption of meat completely in uh, the practice and amongst Buddhists. And before I go on to that, I don't understand why people want to always come to Buddhists and talk about cons consuming meat when there's other practices in this world, other doctrines that fully uh, support eating meat. In fact, there are, there are some spiritual doctrines that uh, believe in sacrificing animals in a, at a certain time of the year um, in hundreds, right? So I think if you're an activist, if, you believe, if you're in veganism or vegetarianism, I think you're barking up the wrong tree coming to Buddhism, and I'll explain why. I think you need to be on websites or uh, need to be going to websites in the comment sections where, uh, to, where doctrine, to people who are following doctrines who actually consume meat and think it's okay. I think you need to be going over there instead of always coming to Buddhism. And one thing I have a little gripe about is that Eating meat, yes, it's an important thing in the world, but in terms of the spiritual doctrine, in terms of what Buddhism has to offer, it's such a small little thing. It's really small, right? And I'll explain why, <clears throat> you know, in a moment. So, you know, as Buddhists, right, there, there are many, many rules. Uh, there are many, many kind of uh, stipulations and parameters, right, that we need to follow. The other thing that I need to stipulate before we get we talk about anything else, right, is that Buddhism is a spiritual discipline. It's not a government, okay? It's not a police force, right? It's not like in Buddhism we control every person's action and someone's running up behind them. Oh, you did this. Oh, you did that. It's not like that. It's it's everyone. It's a do-it-yourself practice. Okay, it's a do-it-yourself practice, right? And every temple, right? Every temple is its, is its own little like uh, republic, and it depends on what the te how the teacher views the situation, uh, views the rules, or views the practice, and everybody usually follows the rules of that temple. And each temple is vastly different. Okay, now the vegetarian thing, as far as I understand, right, that did not start in Buddhism per se. Okay, that was more of a cultural thing introduced um, in China, as far as I know, right? This is what I know. And if you disagree, <clears throat> or if you uh, think different, or <clears throat> have a different version, please let me know. I'm not fixated on this, but this is what I've heard after um, asking many monks, reading many books, and doing some research. What I found that uh, in, in, a, in, in a period in China, there was an emperor... <clears throat> who was a Taoist, right? And at the age of 40, he converted to Buddhism. Now, in Taoism at that time, eating meat was forbidden. So most Taoists were vegetarian, okay? So when he became emperor and, and when he converted to Buddhism, he forbade the monks um, eating meat, right? So at that point, the monks in China were not allowed to eat meat. And I'm not sure if it's that same emperor that forbade the monks going on walking on arms round in the morning, collecting the food in the bowl, right? So arms round and eating meat was forbidden by monks, uh, by that by 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 the emperor, right? Or emperors, as far as I know. And then that spread. That's why vegetarianism is mainly um, part of Mahayana Buddhism, right? Which spread to China, Japan, Korea, and a lot of Mahayana monks are, are strictly vegetarian. And I think that that's because of that practice. But if you look at even the Buddha's last meal, it was uh, a swine uh, gruel, gruel made out of uh, 
pig meat, right? Pig flesh. So the Buddha ate meat as well, right? But there was but there was a certain condition, there were certain conditions placed, right? Now you may agree with this, you may not, and you may not think it's tight enough, right? But here is my explanation once and for all, and I'll try to make it detailed so I don't have to talk to, talk about this subject ever again because there's so many other things to talk about. And like I said, go and go to webs go to websites and or go to uh, go to institutions which condone eating of meat and they have no controls on it. Stop coming to Buddhism. I mean, do what you want, but but please leave me alone with this meat eating meat thing, okay? Because uh, once you understand how Buddhism works, you'll understand that it makes it very hard to eat meat just generally, right? But, okay, so first thing you have to understand, right? In Buddha's day, as today, not when Buddha went arms round and the monks went arm round, not every lay person on the street was a Buddhist, okay? So you had, a lot, I guess at the time there were many different religions. Um, Hinduism or Hindu is a general term that it, which is derived from the Hindus Valley, right? So if you learn, if you're from the Hindus Valley, you, you're a Hindu. But in Hindu, there's many different practices. There's many different gods. And there's many different ways of uh, looking at it, I suppose. But you have Brahmanism, Vedanta, there's fire worship. There's all kinds of, like, there's so many, I can't even... So anyway, what I'm getting at is that when, when a monk goes for arms round, right, in the morning, okay, anyone can put food in the bowl. The monk doesn't discriminate, okay? It's not, but we don't ask for food, we walk quietly. But anyone, like here, even here in Thailand, right, anyone can put food in the bowl. You can, I've had Muslims put food in my bowl, Christians, uh, even uh, not just uh, in Thailand, but when I've gone arms around in other countries, Christians, Muslims, uh, Jewish people, uh, 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 Catholics, uh, all, all kinds of religions, or people from atheists, all kinds of people from different kinds of backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds, different ethnic backgrounds, different uh, spiritual backgrounds or beliefs, right? They put food in the bowl and they don't believe, a lot of these people don't believe um, in vegetarianism either, right? So just keep that in mind. Keep that in mind, right? The second thing you need to keep in, keep in mind is that a monk can choose what they can eat, right? So in other words, even if someone offers something, it doesn't mean the monk's going to eat it, okay? It doesn't mean the monk's going to eat it, right? So you've got to keep that in mind. So, so a lot of monks in Theravada actually are vegetarian. They don't eat meat. There's a lot of monks like that, you know, um, in this practice by choice, by personal choice. But here's where it gets very tricky, right? Now I'll explain as if I forget something, uh, I'll, I'll catch it up down the track because this is a big topic in terms of the meat eating. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole subject in the, in the Buddhist discipline, right? In the monastic discipline. Because first of all, we have the first precept, okay? Uh, refrain from killing any living beings. So any Buddhist, any monk has to refrain from killing living beings. Now, one might say, so why is a Buddhist killing living beings? Exactly. Go and ask that Buddhist. Okay? Because we, sh we, we, we sh the first precept is do not kill any living beings. The second precept, um, the, not sorry, the, the, the forbidden livelihood, right? One of the forbidden livelihoods is um, refrain from uh, raising animals for slaughter. So not only do we have uh, not only do we have refrain from killing living beings, we also have the forbidden livelihood which the Buddha set forth, which the Buddha proclaimed as raising animals for slaughter. So you can't even do, so you, if, if you're a Buddhist, you shouldn't even be raising animals for, uh, for slaughter. So it ends there, okay, in terms of the lay people. So if lay people aren't putting foods in the, uh, uh, if lay people aren't putting meat in the bowls, monks aren't going to complain. Okay, but then again, when it crosses over, when you're walking into in public areas where there's people from all walks of life putting food in the bowl, here are the other conditions. Okay, 
So the three famous conditions, which which are generally known amongst uh, in Theravada on, uh, in a big way, is one: if the monk um, sees the animal being killed. <clears throat> so in other words, if I'm walking down the street with my bowl and and a lay person says, "Oh, Nimon, hang, uh, hang on, monk, hang on, hang on, uh, venerable," um, and has a chicken right there chops its head off and puts the chicken in my bowl, I can't accept it because I saw the animal being killed. The second one, if I, if I hear it, so I'm walking down the street, the, the lay person says, hang on, venerable. He runs into the backyard. I hear a chop with an ax. I hear the, the, the chicken screaming or whatever, and then I hear the chop. He comes out and throws the chicken in, in my bowl. I heard that animal being killed for me. So can't accept that. The other one, which is even the more interesting one and the most difficult one to get around on, if, if the monk thinks, right, if the monk thinks the animal was killed for his consumption. <clears throat> so if someone comes out and, and, I have a, and I suspect or think that that person just killed the animal directly for me, then I can't accept it. But here's where it gets even more complicated, right, is that monks can't eat raw meat. So in other words, if someone bought a chicken from the supermarket and it's frozen and they put that in my bowl, I can't accept it, right? I can't accept it. It has to be cooked. So in other words, the, it's kind of like when a family um, has their meal at night, right? Because usually when we go arms around, it's usually leftovers, right? Usually. Some people like to buy food immediately um, or prepare food. That's okay. But generally, it's leftovers. So the, the whole idea is what the family eats is their issue. It's their business. It's their business. Now, virtue signers and, you, and some of you fascist people out there who want, who want to control the whole world, every family has a right to eat however they want as far as I'm concerned. As long as not, they're not you know, harm, like doing any harm in that sense. Okay. They, well, again, doing harm in the Buddhist way. But again, we have to respect that there are other traditions and other ways of life in this world and people don't see it the way we see it so that's fair enough okay so i'm not gonna go on a rampage of uh pointing fingers at people for what they consume right unless it's illegal stuff you know like human meat things like that okay so anyway um getting back on topic the meat has to be cooked okay so a family generally would eat a meal and they would and they would buy the, the food or prepare the food for the family first then whatever's left over, they can give to the monk. And then the monk can choose, right? But if, if it's meat, it has to be, even fish, it has to be cooked. We cannot eat sushi, for example, or sashimi, right? We can't, monk can't eat sashimi. It all has to be cooked. So it definitely has to go through a process, right? The other um, requirement here is that we monks are forbidden to eat certain many certain kinds of meat. For example, we can't eat, uh, I hope uh, I might miss some out here because there's quite a few. We can eat tigers, lions, bears, snakes, horses, dogs, cats, uh, moose, uh, big animals, I guess, donkeys, elephants, uh, zebras, um, deer, uh, all that, all, you know. Basically, <clears throat> the Buddha said the only kind of meats that <clears throat> are allowable in that are allowable if they've if they've gone through the right process, the correct process, are more of the animal husbandry animals that you see. <clears throat> and generally, it wouldn't be Buddhists having these animals. It'd be other traditions having these animals, right? Raising these animals. So things like fowl, pig, uh, chickens, things like that. All right. So after all this complex process, this is what Buddhism has done to try to minimize. Um, the, the killing of living beings. And for a Buddhist, someone who's really following uh, the Buddhist precepts, uh, a Buddhist shouldn't be, uh, should be refraining from killing living beings and refraining from raising animals for slaughter as a beginning, as a layperson, right? So if every Buddhist did this, then, that, then, the, pro then the problem solved, it's moot, okay? But you know, you can't, you can't control the world and it's hard to tell 
you know, these people always come to pick on monks. Monks, we, 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 we live a life of non-violence. There's nothing to fear when you tell off a monk, right? You can always stick it to the monk or be courageous and tell a monk something because you know the monks are not going to hurt you. You just know the monk's not going to hurt you. But be careful because not everybody's like this in the world. You know, with social media, people have become too courageous behind the keyboard and forgotten <clears throat> the fact that, you know, the intimate relationship with someone and respect, right? Courteousness, respect, right? Which on the internet, you know, it's so easy, especially when you're an anonymous. That's the other thing. When you're an anonymous, when, when you've got an, an uh, anonymous identity and you make a comment, it's very easy to just, uh, you know, throw out all, you know, <clears throat> regurgitate offensive things and without any consequence. So, you know, it's very easy like that. You'll see that most, you know, a proper Buddhist, someone who really has their name, is not scared, is, is got everything, um, is not hiding from anything. But, you know, we've got, everybody's afraid of the internet these days and all this. But I would say to you, never be, a, never hide. Don't hide unless, unless it's skillful hiding. It's hiding for, to protect yourself or your family because there's tyranny on your doorstep. Different story, right? I didn't say lie. I didn't say lie or deceive. Because having privacy and protecting yourself and protecting your ident identity is, is good, is, is necessary too. For example, I protect my identity by, by not saying things that are private on the internet, right? But anyway, you can find, even if I'm not in the, on, on the internet, you can find my details everywhere. Like anyone can be found on the internet. It's not a, it's not hard to do. There are sites that actually specialize in this, right? Anybody can find out your phone number, your address. Like anyone can find photos of you. It's, it's just, that's the age of the internet and that's just how it is. But you know, for, for, for all of you who are, who comment and have an, an anonymous ID, you know, um, don't be surprised uh, going further if I just don't respond to you, okay? Because I don't know who you are and I don't know um, whether you're being sincere or just trolling or whatever. And I don't care about trolls. Trolls or, Troll all you like, right? If you get out of hand, I'll just remove you. It's, it's that easy, okay? So I'm not worried about it. <clears throat> so coming back to this meat scenario, right? I've explained all the different... <clears throat> Sorry, I have to have a bit of a drink. Coming back to this uh, uh, meat scenario, right? In Buddhism, we've done a lot. Buddhism ha Buddha has set down the rules um, to make it virtually impossible for any Buddhist to kill an animal or consume an animal or raise an animal, right? But again, what I, the la I'll ask you to, I'll repeat this again. You need to consider that when, an anka, when a monk goes arms round, we are doing it because we're giving the, the, the community opportunity to do merit. So even if someone is not a Buddhist and doesn't follow Buddhism and they want to give food, we allow them to do merit. But we don't go and then and, 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 and say, like, for example, uh, Muslims um, eat meat and they believe in that. We don't go to the Muslim and say, you shouldn't be eating meat, you shouldn't be killing animals and start a big, huge argument there when that's how they believe things. And, you know, so, it, so this is the thing. If world peace is also accepting the fact that you can't change the world is allowing people to um, live how they want to live. We have laws. We have civilization. Okay, we have laws that try to keep everything to a reasonable level of uh, harmony, and even that's difficult to do. So, you know, it's not that simple, okay? It's not that simple to create world peace. So first of all, you need to, in I guess, one needs inside themselves is to try to, First of all, we don't have control of the body because it ages and dies whenever it wants. And we don't have, con and even more so, we don't have control of external factors. So, you know, to, to try to gain control of something you'll never have control of is, or is folly, right? It's foolish. And it's a waste of time. And you'll just end up, end up really upset in the end. You'll end up very delusional and upset. You're not going to get anywhere with that. Okay, so... Try to rethink it. So this, hopefully this is the first and last time I'll ever have to talk about meat um, and the discussion about meat. Um, 
Oh yeah, there's one more meat. We can't eat human meat, okay? We can't eat human meat. And I'm sure I missed some out. Um, but yeah, we can't eat human meat, okay? Oh, monkeys. We can't eat monkeys. There's so many that we can't eat, right? So it's only really relegated to the animal husbandry types, the general farming ones that other traditions other traditions use, okay? Other forms of uh, other practices, other doctrines um, use, right? So, so hopefully this meat debate, I'm not going to debate it, okay? I'm not going to debate it anymore. I've said everything. Now, no, actually, one more thing on this. When I receive food in my bowl, okay, depending on how many people give food the day, I don't eat all of it, right? I choose what I want to eat, and then I give the rest away, okay? <clears throat> now, most of the time, I don't consume meat. I don't consume it, right? And sometimes I do. Okay, sometimes I do, depending on what it is. If it's a little chicken leg or something. Now, at this point, it's gone through all the processes, and I and I eat it with humility. I, and that's the other thing. I guess that's the other thing. Before a monk can eat, usually it's uh, the Buddha laid in a practice. Monk has to reflect on the food. So monk actually has to say something like, um, you know, this food was given to me. For health and strength, <clears throat> not for fun, beauty, or pleasure. Right? This, there, there may be animals in here which have died, and I am consuming them. Right? So you have to bring that reflection to the fore every single time. So I eat with humility, so as to cross over to the shore, to cross over to the other shore. So in other words, we reflect on our food and. Every time we, if we're eating meat or anything, we have to reflect on the animal and what it is. The Buddha wants us to reflect on it completely. And that usually leads to abstination anyway. So the very few times that I eat a bit of meat or whatever, or fish or something, after it's gone through all those processes, I don't have any shame. I don't have any shame. I'm telling you, you know who you are. I'm telling you, I have no shame. And... I don't want to hear about it anymore. I've explained it, okay? So, so you know, I've minimized, you know, in Buddhism, we've minimized the whole killing of animals. Simply, there's so many, and there's things that I've probably missed here, but there's so many other details about this. Okay, now moving on. Next subject, uh, I want to talk about uh, the practice of generosity and why generosity is also compassion. It's also one of the indirect uh, branches of, I guess, a branch of compassion. And why generosity? Why all the people around you are waiting for your generosity? So, generosity, right? Generosity is not um, uh, what we call, uh, what's the word now? Oh, it's not coming to mind, but it will. It will. It's usual when I do these videos, I'm on the spot. But yeah, altruism, that's it. Generosity is not altruism. Altruism is I make $100 and I give $100 away. I forget about myself. Total sacrifice. Now, there's a place for altruism in certain areas, right? In certain areas, sometimes, like sometimes uh, in certain situations, one needs to do that from time to time in certain situations, right? <clears throat> But for day to day, for the day to day, it's not necessary. Generosity is giving a portion, right? He's always giving a portion and giving back to society or giving back to things just beyond yourself, your family, and just your little world or our little world, but outside of that. Okay? Now, without generosity, okay, we live in a very brutal world right now, and it has been for a long time. People need generosity. Generosity is powerful, okay? I remember I remember when I was down on my luck uh, in my 20s and I had nowhere to turn. I had nowhere to turn. And uh, someone, a friend of mine's, uh, a friend popped out and uh, he said to me, I really believe in you and I want you to succeed. Here's some money. And he gave me a certain amount of money. But I want it back, he said. I want it back. 
And uh, that boost, that generosity, right? That generosity <clears throat> of that person on that day changed my life. It had such a deep, profound effect on me that I decided, you know, I've paid it forward in many ways with many other people. I've given away things. I've done It's just when someone is generous, it doesn't have to be a big amount. It doesn't have to be, you know, the amount is kind of irrelevant, okay? But generosity is a form of compassion when we understand that someone's down on their luck, right? Now, of course, there's always the people who abuse the situation, okay? There's always charlatans. There's always people who, you know, try to push it. So, but I say to the giver, right? It's kind of like there was a period where, and they're probably still going on, uh, in different, I knew in New York, in Sydney, there were people getting dressed up as monks and walking around asking for, for donations, right? So I had people come to me, I had some people come to me and say, well, you know, they shouldn't be doing this, this is wrong, and yes, 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 yes. Okay, all right. But in terms of the giver, it doesn't affect you, right? Because you still, when you give without conditions, right? This is the two different types of giving first. When you give out with, without conditions, you'll never be ripped off. You shouldn't be. Even if the, the unconditional part is that you give and you just forget about it. So even if the person's a thief, even if the person's like uh, a homeless person and they're going to use the money for alcohol, it's not your concern. I mean, a lot of people say that I'm not going to give the homeless person any money because that homeless person is going to use it on drugs and alcohol. Okay, maybe, and but maybe they'll spend a portion on some food, right? And it also depends how you give it to them. You can give, you can also condition the giving and say, just get some food, but you can't control it, right? So, but in any case, when you give without conditions, um, you know, it's you, you'll never get ripped off. You'll never get it, it's never it's you'll never get thieved from, or it's like a never, I guess, be done you know, done by kind of thing, right? It's not like you're going to uh, be cheated, right? So <clears throat> when you give something and you give it without conditions, you just give it, the person could literally pick whatever, uh, have whatever that you've given them and throw it in the rubbish and you shouldn't, it shouldn't even affect you. And that's the ultimate level of giving, which I tried to talk about in a previous video. That's the apex of giving. That's the apex of compassion. You're doing something without asking for anything in return. You're leaving it totally unconditional, right? Now, the rewards are that you you gain a certain level of confidence and strength, but mentally, you start to develop a lot of joy in the mind, right? You start to develop a lot of uh, happiness because you know you're doing good deeds and not asking for anything in return. Now, the condition giving is where people always get upset, where people feel cheated. So in other words, there's a lot of this conditional thinking going on. Someone, someone gives someone $1,000 expecting that maybe that person is going to give them a favor later on in life or something like that, right? So the per when, when you give, I'm going to give them 1000 hopefully this person, if they get rich, they can buy me a house later or something like that, right? You're always going to get upset when you, you're not, your mind is never going to enter a state of joy or happiness when you give with that kind of uh, conditioning, right? So, you know, there's a lot of people that say generosity doesn't really work. It doesn't lead to happiness. That's because you're giving with condition. Whenever you give something with condition, if the condition is not met, or at least if you're not clear about the condition. For example, if I work, if I give my labor to, uh, to, to, to someone and it's, there's a condition of, okay, I want $30 an hour or $40 an hour, whatever, right? There's a certain level of yeah, there's a condition. Now, when the when when the person comes back and gives me half of that, I'm going to be upset, right? <clears throat> because the condition wasn't met. But if I work and I say whatever I get, I get, and I and but I mean really, whatever I get, I get. <clears throat> you get five dollars, you get a hundred dollars. You're not going to care because you've already set it out as unconditional. And I'm not saying that that's a wise thing to do when you're working. I'm talking about generosity. I'm not talking about earning a living, right? <clears throat> Two different things, okay? But anyway, in the unconditional, um, in the unconditional uh, way of doing things, 
is when you're generous unconditionally with people, you're also shedding a lot of greed, a lot of attachment, a lot of craving, a lot of clinging to things and things that you have, right? <clears throat> Which also gives you a sense of lightness, a sense of, um, uh, you start to feel lighter, right? There's a sense of joy that starts to, to run through your mind and happiness. You start, it's, it, it actually elevates you, right? It elevates your state of mind into more of a serene state of mind. Now, if you don't believe me, try it a few times and see what happens. See what happens, right? Uh, go to a temple, give some food, give some finances, give some candles, give some robes or, or give some cloth or something like that. Give some toiletries. See a homeless person, uh, give them $20 and just walk away, right? <clears throat> don't ask for anything. See how you feel later. Do it a few times. See how it makes you feel. Not just homeless people. It's not just homeless people who need help. Everybody needs, even rich people, <clears throat> even wealthy people need a bit of, need compassion. And I'm probably not in the financial sense, but they need compassion. Maybe they need to be told some truth. Maybe need, they need someone to listen, someone um, <clears throat> to just treat them for a normal person and not, you know, trying to get money off them all the time. Everybody needs compassion. Even the king needs compassion, right? <clears throat> so compassion is, and gen Compassion is a big quality missing from this world. There are many other qualities, but today I'm going to talk about compassion in the form of generosity. Now, get busy because there are people waiting for your generosity around you, not just your family, but your community. How do you expect the community to thrive if, okay, if the government is being tyrannical and the people are not being generous? Think about that for a moment. If the government is being tyrannical and the people are not being generous with one another, okay, wow, what a dark world it will be, okay, what a dark world it will be, all right, so there's your solution, generosity, well, at least a part of the solution, it's more complicated, right, but generosity is definitely something that goes beyond just giving $20 to someone, okay, there's a lot more to it. You know, you see, you see someone struggling, you, you know, uh, or you see someone who's, who's, who, may, who may not say it, um, they may not say it, uh, they may not be asking, they might be too, um, too proud or too, uh, uh, too afraid. Uh, we call it grenje in Thailand. It's kind of like, like a sense of shame. You're too, you're too afraid to ask. You have, you're too, you, you have a sense of shame. You don't want to ask someone else for help, right? You know, sometimes we can see these situations, right? You give someone some time. Like you see elderly people around you and they repeat the same story over and over again. Never mind, just listen, just be patient. Let them say the same story over and over again, right? You're letting them just talk because they don't get to talk much to a lot of people or express themselves. You know, you're giving them some joy, right? That's generous. That's really good for uh, for yourself and for other people. You know, give, give people, you know, little gifts, here and there you know that's part of generosity uh, and generosity also leads to happiness why not in your mind because when you help change someone's life okay that has a big merit that has a big energy right it has big energy big movement big power right I never you know since since uh, I'll that person helped me back in my 20s and I've had help from other people obviously I'm not really uh, but, you know, I'm sure all of you have had someone, you know, throw you a bone when you needed it or lend a hand when you've needed it down the track. Remember that. Remember what it did it did to you, what it, how it affected you, right? How it changed your life for the better, you know, uh, even, in, if, even if it's in a small way, right? The generosity for, in your local area, in your local situ, living situation, um, helps in a lot of ways. Trust me, it uh, helps to gain trust in the community. It helps to gain a little bit of solidarity. It helps to gain, uh, I guess, security in the local community as well. When, when, when you have a local community, right, when you're living in a local community and everybody's giving to each other as much as best as they can and helping each other out and people know that there's that spirit going on, You'll see how different it is. 
okay? But, you know, someone needs to lead the way because everybody in different world, parts of the world live different kind of, have different kind of communities. And these days, the governments are becoming a little bit more, let's say, tyrannical. I suppose a little bit more and tyrannical are oxymorons, right? They don't go together. But what we've seen from the COVID, what we've seen from from a lot of other things in the last two or three years has, has, has got me concerned. So this is why I'm telling you, right, and you the viewer, the person listening, right, is to start to be generous around you because that's going to benefit you too, right? See, a lot of people don't think when there's a lot of homeless people in your area, that's not good for you. It's not good for your kids. And it's good for the homeless people to be eating and to have somewhere to sleep and have some shelter. It's good for them. Now, of course, that's a very simplistic solution because there are some homeless people that are hell bent on drugs and they're too far gone and they can't be helped. But, but at least feed them. At least make sure they're getting fed. At least make sure they're getting fed and have the basics so they don't go out and steal. Okay? Because when someone's hungry and doesn't have the basic requirements, that's that's likely to do crime but not necessarily true in all cases not necessarily true because there are a lot of white there's a lot of white collar crime blue collar crime people who are wealthy doing crime so i'm just talking about the general person on the street situation um generally a lot of those homeless people if they're not on drugs and if they're they might have a mental illness right a lot of them have mental illnesses so, you know, they still deserve to be fed. Everyone deserves to be fed as far as I'm concerned. So anyway, it's not the, the, the silver bullet solution to removing homelessness. That's a hard one, right? We'll talk about that in depth. I'll talk about that in depth some other time. I had some ideas on it, but I don't have any solutions to it. Because again, homelessness also comes down to choice. It comes down to karma, vipaka, consequences. It comes down to the way you see life. There are actually some homeless people that want to stay homeless. I remember this because um, I've had, you know, walk in the streets, I meet a lot of homeless people and I've had many conversations with them. And some of them um, actually, actually just don't want to be in society anymore. They actually prefer living out there and they don't, they really dislike it when people try to save them, right? Some are like that, but some aren't like that. Some 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 want to return but they just don't know how right so again you know it's 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 a bit complicated but at least if you know they got something to eat not that you're responsible for me helping them eat every day right and also there should be uh there are government agencies that should be looking at that are looking after that i suppose but even then it doesn't matter just because you pay taxes doesn't mean everything's taken care of doesn't mean the taxes are spent um are spent wisely which they're not you know billions of dollars are spent in weapons every year right so <clears throat> you know um the whole taxes thing i i do believe in giving back into society but again you know what i tell people with taxes is this okay when you pay your taxes just pay it unconditionally just say okay i'm doing something good for society and leave it you know you can't get out of it how it's spent well it's up to them it's on them because Remember this, right? When you give something and you give it with your whole heart, no matter how big or small, and you give it with body, speech, mind, with focus, right? And you give with that unconditional awareness that, you know, I don't expect anything in return. I give it because I want to give it. That's it. Because I want to give it to this person or give it to this organization or whatever, right? You decide that, you, you, you make that determination and you give it. That's just good karma for you. That's good consequences. Now, how, whatever the person, that if you give to a person that is a wise person, that is an honorable person, that's even bigger merit, okay? That's like you're, it's even getting going even further, right? And if it's not, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter because, you know, the consequences from giving, uh, the bad consequences, of there's virtually zero, right? If your mind is focused in, in the unconditional aspect. Okay, um, so when you're when you're giving in that unconditional aspect to someone, there's very little bad consequences that are going to come back. Very few, actually. There might be one. I don't know because I don't like to talk in absolute. 
but I doubt it in this case. Okay, there could be, you know, it might come to me later. But you definitely, definitely don't worry if, you know, when you give something, you'll never get cheated if it's unconditional. If it's conditional, you'll be cheated. You'll be cheated, right? You'll be upset. So this is why generosity is a practice. Because the Buddha says, be generous, learn to be generous unconditionally. Because it helps you get to a wider conscious, not, it helps to widen the con. See, consciousness, and I don't like to use that, word, helps to widen your awareness, your sati. It helps to uh, open the door to states of, to states of joy and happiness and states of equanimity. Why equanimity is because when you give unconditionally, just to anybody, you're developing the state of equanimity, right? Which is a state of the fourth jhana in samadhi, right? In samadhi. So this is why it's very skill it's a skillful practice because it helps you shed a lot, it helps shed a lot of clinging and craving, a lot of greed, a lot of hatred, a bit a lot of discrimination, right? A lot of things. Generosity is a very strong practice, a very, very powerful practice with very powerful consequences, powerful positive consequences. So I hope I've done that today. I've talked about the meat issue. Again, if you ever comment on my channel about the meat issue anymore, about telling me about meat again, you're going to be ignored. I've answered the question. Go to some other spiritual doctrine um, website that condone eating meat um, and go and, you know, another, just on a parting thing, buy a, go, go to the animal shelter. This is what I have for you. This is... The solution I have for you people if you're so concerned with the killing of animals right and I'm not saying that sarcastically condescendingly or trying to be rude okay I'm saying I'm saying if you're so concerned right if you're so concerned buy some land where you can raise animals okay then right get with a group of people buy some land go to all the slaughterhouses in the world and buy up the animals and put them and then let them run free in your in your land okay are you prepared to do that no okay well then what are you prepared to do just you know come and comment on on you know on on certain chats and do and that's it okay what do you so you, you're talking about saving animals what are you doing to save animals if you want to save animals okay go to the animal slaughterhouses they do this in thailand there's, there's some temples that take in um, uh, animals from, uh, they used to be, they used to live in slaughterhouses, right? And there, there, are, there are people, there, there's actual groups who do this. They go to slaughterhouses, they buy the, the animals that were, were going to be slaughtered, and they release them in, in these certain temples on these certain parts of, in certain lands, right? They do this, they're, people actually do this, okay? So and that's something you could do. Instead of just, you know, yelling at us monks, about eating meat and yelling at people about eating meat start doing things like this you know take action don't you know don't talk do it you know don't just you know don't don't be uh, like telling people what to do what they should be doing and you're not doing you know because abstaining from living abstaining from killing at living beings abstaining from raising animals for slaughter is already a lot and that's what i'm doing already i don't kill animals I don't kill living beings. I don't raise animals for slaughter. I eat food given fr from arms. Okay? I'm doing my bit. I'm doing my bit. What are you doing? Right? A lot of monks are already doing their bit. That's what people fail to understand. Okay? It's not my job to tell a fam someone in the family or some householder, hey, <clears throat> you need to be doing this. That's not my job. Okay? Now, when I walk the street, for arms round okay when i walk the street for arms round it's not my job to tell every person on the street what to do what food they should cook and how they should live especially if they don't even come to the temple and they're not buddhist what you think everybody on the streets buddhist you think everybody in thailand's a buddhist well you're mistaken there's muslims here there's christians here there's hindus here there's there's jews here there's there's judaists here there's all kinds of people here and on the street you get all kinds of people putting food in the bowl. So the monk is supposed to shut up and be quiet. And guess what? Have eyes to the ground, eyes lowered, right? Eyes lowered and very little talking to who puts food in the bowl. Okay, it's not our job to go around telling people what to do. 
okay? We can talk about what the Dharma is, and we can talk about what the rules are, but then that that relies on each individual person to carry it out how they see, right? And in every temple, there reaches a consensus. But are you saying that every human being that lives in a temple all follows the same rules? They don't. And in Buddhism, we don't pretend to hide this. We don't try to have this kind of, oh, we're perfect and pure. Then you don't know Buddhists. Then you don't know monks. Hang around some monks because we don't pretend. Well, at least the monks I've learned, we don't try to pretend to be anything. We do our best to follow the rules, which they're hard to do. Okay? But if you're looking for that kind of pure, um, I guess, pure environment, create it yourself. Yeah, because there's a lot of these people that talk in these purest ways, but in their life, personally, in the when when the doors when the lights are out and the doors are shut, they're a whole different person. You know, their persona is something in public and a different in in private. No, in in Buddhism, especially in temples, it's hard to do. You can't hide. So what I do in private is what I do in public, except some things like toilet. You know, you know there are some limits to this. Okay, but. You know, wherever there's human beings and there's uh, defilements, there's kilesa, there's mental effluence, um, there's going to be issues, there's going to be rules broken, okay? So if you think that as a Buddhist, because I've had this comment, that we try to paint that we're perfect and we all follow the rules perfectly, you're wrong. You're wrong. That's the wrong, you've got the wrong picture because it's 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 evolving. Well, you know, rules get broken because for a lot of reasons. Okay, for a lot, and it's not usually because of bad intent. Sometimes it's not usually intent. Sometimes you forget about the rule, or you just you you lapse in concentration, and it happens. Okay, so uh, you know if if you want to go around on all these comments and chat groups and all these kind of, we'll go around telling people, pointing the finger at people, and telling people what to do all the time. Yet you're doing nothing. You're doing nothing. Well, I tell you what, you're not going to be a very confident person, okay? You're not going to have much uh, uh, strength and conviction in yourself and your mind, the state of your mind, always going out and pointing fingers at people and blaming people instead of understanding and learning to understand uh, the truth of things and uh, penetrate wisdom, you know, the state of your mind, you know, you're going to be miserable in your life, you know? Choose better. Choose better. Do better. <sighs> May you grow in Dharma.